You know how they say that all roads lead to New Orleans? Yeah, actually, nobody says that. But all water leads to New Orleans, sort of. 41% of the country within the Mississippi River Basin. Well, anyway, New Orleans is one of the top tourist destinations. In the United States, it has been for a long time because of its culture, its rich history, and while it's fencing, a lot of that can be found in the French Quarter. That would be a different video. In this video, I'm going to check out the downtown area. Let's get to it, shall we? This is the Crescent City Connection. Sometimes it's referred to by its original name of being the Greater New Orleans Bridge. Yet, Department of Transportation signs call it the Mississippi River Bridge. Whatever you want to call it, you can get great views of the downtown skyline as you head into downtown over the mighty Mississippi. The bridge connects the West Bank with the East Bank, which is actually kind of weird because in New Orleans, the East Bank is actually on the west side of the river, and the west bank is on the east side of the river. An illustration might help explain that. When looking at a zoomed out map, it's obvious to see what side of the Mississippi is west and which side is east. Not so much when you're looking at a zoomed in map of New Orleans, but the south side of the river is technically the west bank of the Mississippi, while the north side is the east bank, so that's why the east side is called West Bank, and the west side is called East Bank. Well, New Orleans might be a directionally challenged city, but this isn't a directionally challenged video, as we're going to move things forward here. This video will be the first of 30 videos within my New Orleans series where I explore the entire city. We'll go over all of the good and bad with New Orleans in not only this video, but within the entire 30 video series, and that starts now. Let's start on a positive note, as there's plenty of great things to mention about this town, like the amount of sewerage and waterboard trucks that serve the city. If you're a resident of New Orleans, it should be a great feeling to know how there are dozens of trucks on the streets at all times, working to keep you safe from a sewer overflow. This particular one happened to be stolen and ditched just north of the French Quarter. Okay, okay, but really, as many of you know, New Orleans has some of the richest history for a major city in the country, so... There's a lot of things to appreciate from that aspect. Likewise, if you're a visitor, there's a lot of things to go do and see. But also, as many of you know, there's plenty of not-so-good things to mention about this town, like the current direction of the New Orleans Saints. Yeah, I got news for you. If you're a native after watching this series, you might hate me just as much as you hate NFL officials for the 2018 NFC Championship game. I mean, I hope you don't hate me, that's definitely not the goal of me making this video, but I guess we'll see how you guys really feel in the comments section over time, right? Well, feelings aside, we're going to head down Canal Street and talk all about the fame and glory that is Canal Street. We start off with the shops at Canal Place to the right. It's actually a pretty nice downtown shopping mall, crowded, but... It's nicely kept up with, and it's in a good location considering how many hotels are in walking distance. The shops at Canal Place are conveniently located right across Canal Street from Harris Casino, so if you're a married guy like me and you want to let your wife and her girlfriend shop while you gamble away your hard-earned money, you can do just that on your next vacation to New Orleans. Harris actually is among the top employers in the Big Easy, which tells you everything that you should know about the economy. Inside Harrah's is the Fillmore New Orleans, making the end of Canal Street one of the more happening places in downtown. Other amenities within a block from here include the VU New Orleans, a separate shopping mall called Riverwalk Outlets, Spanish Plaza, and the Audubon Aquarium. The VU New Orleans is like an indoor-outdoor museum. You also have an observation deck of the Mississippi River. 
Spanish Plaza is right behind it, which complements all of the other venues along the riverfront and Canal Street. And lastly, the Audubon Aquarium sits just northeast of the VU New Orleans, which gives you even more things to check out if you like aquariums. As we head away from the river along Canal Street, the thoroughfare is decked with historic hotels on both sides of the street. We just passed the New Orleans Marriott on the right. Up ahead, other hotels include Wyndham New Orleans, Crown Plaza New Orleans, the Ritz-Carlton, the Saint Hotel, and the Roosevelt New Orleans, among others. It's a very tourist-friendly thoroughfare with trolleys running 24 hours a day. The streetcars make frequent stops during the day and hourly appearances from midnight to 6 a.m. The fare per person is $1.25 at the time of me making this video, and that goes for all of the streetcar lines, as Canal Street is only one of five in New Orleans, with the other lines being the St. Charles Avenue line, the Riverfront line, the Loyola Avenue line, and the Rampart St. Claude line. What you can see here, however, is how four of the five streetcar lines run along Canal Street at one point or another, making Canal Street a major mass transit hub for New Orleans. Canal Street is pretty significant as it's among the most historic streets in all of America. Back in the day, it was the spot of several major department stores back when department stores were large office buildings in downtown areas of cities. These stores included Godshaw's, Maison Blanche, and D.H. Holmes. From around the 1850s to the 1950s, Canal Street was by far and away the largest shopping district in the greater New Orleans region. Those department stores are no longer here, but as I showed you earlier, retail continues to have a big role in today's Canal Street. Well, just as much as Canal Street has always been a central area for some shopping in New Orleans, it's also been a huge entertainment hub throughout its lifetime. They say that Canal Street was home to the world's first movie theater, that being Vitascope Hall, which was built in 1896. Today, there's a movie theater in New Orleans off of Loyola with the same name in honor of the Vitascope Hall, but the original Vitascope Hall in New Orleans was at 623 Canal Street, which is right where we are, at the intersection with Exchange Place, where the Voodoo Market is. That's where the world's first movie theater was established. Make sure to drop a like for that amazing insight. Also, if you've been to New Orleans and you have some good memories here, or maybe this is your hometown, feel free to share whatever your thoughts are on New Orleans in the comments below. I'd love to hear some stories. Alright, well moving on now is some more amazing insight about Canal Street would be that it's the historic dividing line between the French Quarter, or Vu Carre, and the American sector of town, which is today's central business district. The reason for this was because what was then called Vu Carre was already developed, being the oldest part of the city. Once the Louisiana Purchase happened in 1803, Americans from the Midwest started flocking to New Orleans, creating what was then a new section of the city. And basically, Canal Street ended up serving as the dividing line between the two cultures. Since there were tensions between the native Louisiana Creole people and the New Americans, the Americans stayed on the west side of Canal Street while the natives stayed on the east side, or where the French Quarter is. Canal Street itself, however, became a neutral ground which helped it thrive as a commercial thoroughfare early on. Canal Street is named as such after the fact that it was actually supposed to be a canal according to original plans. It was this guy who first drew up the plans to have a canal that connected the Mississippi River with Lake Pontchartrain and Bayou St. John, but the canal was never built, and it just became a wide boulevard instead. 171 feet wide to be exact, making it the widest street in America. That being said, don't be that guy from Plains, Kansas to argue in the comments either to say how everyone is wrong and how your town has the widest street, because if that's what you believe, the truth is, you've been lied to your whole life. That's like a different type of corruption. Well, now that we've cleared all of that up, we can now move on. Yeah. Okay, so another fact is that Canal Street was one of the first streets in the world to be completely lit with electric lights. 
I'm not talking about one street light or two street lights. I'm talking about the entire street being lit up with electric lights. So, to summarize, Canal Street was home to the first movie theater in the world. It's the widest street in America. It was one of the premier shopping destinations in the country during the first half of the 20th century. It was one of the first streets to be fully lit with electric lights. There's parades, culture, life, jobs, apartments throughout its 200-year span. Yeah, Canal Street is definitely one of the more historic streets in not only America, but probably in the world. If you were to set aside all of the history of New Orleans and just look at the current population for this town and the metro area, like if you were to remove the name and just look at the numbers, it would be crazy to think of this place as being a world-class city at any point in its existence. You know, being a city that's on the same level as places like New York City, Paris, or London, but 200 years ago, New Orleans was exactly that. Today, the metro area has been surpassed in population by places like Greenville, South Carolina, and Omaha, Nebraska, even places today like Grand Rapids, Michigan, Rochester, New York, and Tulsa, Oklahoma are larger metro areas than New Orleans is. But in 1840, New Orleans was the third largest city in the United States. That year, Los Angeles had less than 1,000 people, Chicago had 4,400 people, and Houston had fewer than 2,000 people. People? New Orleans was among the top 10 largest cities for a 70-year stretch from 1810 to 1880. Hard to imagine that New Orleans will ever sniff the top 10 largest cities in the country ever again. When it comes to the population history, the city saw its population peak in 1960. The reason for the sharp decline immediately following that decade was due to a decline in industrial jobs along with the white middle class fleeing for the newly built suburbs, which was a common theme among many blue-collar cities in the country, during that time. Despite the drastic population decline in the city proper, the greater metro area didn't see a decline from 1960 to 2000. It also didn't see much of a population increase as New Orleans went from being market number 18 in the 1930s to being market number 45 by 2000. New Orleans historically has been largely dependent on the oil industry and with the town being a major port, over the years, automation replaced many of the jobs that were once associated with those industries, and the New Orleans economy never adapted to being a center for tech like other cities did in the late 20th century. Obviously, you have to factor in the impact that Hurricane Katrina had on this area's economy, as most of us understand the devastation that the 2005 hurricane had on this area. Needless to say, the population of both New Orleans and the metro area declined significantly following Hurricane Katrina. The city saw a nice rebound in population from 2010 to 2020, the decade following Katrina's devastation, but that was only to be followed by yet another steep population decline as today, the population of the city is estimated to be at 356,000 people, which is a decline of nearly 30,000 since 2020. The city is largely poverty-stricken, with 23% of residents living below the poverty line. The median household income is over $20,000 per year less than the national average, even with 41% of adults 25 and older holding a bachelor's degree or higher. 
The median value of owner-occupied housing units is $281,000, which is surprising to me as you don't often see home values that high in declining cities with poor economies. Next to the stats for New Orleans, you can see the stats for the metro area as a whole, and those for the state. And, quite frankly, none of those numbers look good when compared to the national averages. On to the crime rates now, as the most recent crime data claims that New Orleans has a violent crime rate of 1,400 for every 100,000 residents, and a property crime rate of 4,600 for every 100,000 residents. New Orleans has, for a long time, had a serious problem with crime, but since 2020, yes, a lot of the major cities in the country have seen huge spikes in crime, but New Orleans has seen a higher spike in crime than the average major city in the United States. In fact, New Orleans was given the title of being the murder capital in 2022, where more homicides occurred here in New Orleans per capita than in any other major city in the United States that year. Before that, St. Louis had an eight-year run of holding that title. New Orleans was able to fall down to third place on that list in 2023 with St. Louis taking back their top spot on the list and Baltimore coming in second place, so hopefully New Orleans can continue to make progress in that area. Unfortunately, crime is high in pretty much every neighborhood of New Orleans, whether it's downtown or the French Quarter, so that's something to be cautious of if you're planning a visit to New Orleans. And don't be one of those in the comments saying, Oh, crime happens in every city and in every popular tourist destination. Don't act like things are that much worse here in New Orleans. Because things actually are that much worse in New Orleans. Yeah. Sorry to break it to you, you New Orleans faithful, but um, you got a pretty big problem here. But we can talk more about the crime and all of the problems that New Orleans faces in other videos within my 30 video series. All right, so moving on now as we're now in the part of the central business district that is the furthest away from the French Quarter. There's quite a few office towers in this corner of downtown, along with some restaurants and other amenities, although not close to the amount of amenities that you'll find along Canal Street and in the French Quarter. There is, however, the Superdome, which is one of the more legendary NFL stadiums in the country. The Superdome opened in 1975, just in time for that year's NFL season, and it's been the home for the Saints ever since. In 1978, only three years after opening, the Superdome hosted its first Super Bowl, that being Super Bowl XII. And believe it or not, Super Bowl XII was actually the fourth Super Bowl held in the city. The previous three were held at Tulane Stadium. Additionally, the Superdome has gone on to host six more Super Bowls, with the seventh one for the Superdome and an eleventh one for the city, coming in February 2025. At the time of me making this video, only Miami has hosted more Super Bowls than New Orleans has, but once Super Bowl 58 happens, New Orleans will be tied with Miami in hosting more Super Bowls than any other city. Of course, anything to do with NFL football isn't all the Superdome is known for, as the Dome has also hosted college football's Sugar Bowl every year since it opened. The Sugar Bowl is regarded as one of the more prestigious college bowl games. Additionally, the BCS National Championship game has been played at the Superdome four times. Outside of football, the Superdome has hosted several noticeable boxing matches back when boxing was a bigger deal in the early 80s. The Superdome has hosted the Final Four six times. The Superdome has hosted the Essence Music Festival every year since 95. The Superdome was also a refuge of last resort, if you will, during Hurricane Katrina, with 30,000 natives being able to take shelter in the giant dome at the time of the storm. The Superdome, however, wasn't indestructible as it took 13 months of repairs and improvements before it could reopen and go back to hosting events. Currently, the Superdome is the fifth longest standing NFL stadium, but it will soon be in second place on that list. Soldier Field in Chicago currently is the longest standing stadium, but that's about to get replaced soon. So is Arrowhead Stadium outside of Kansas City, as is Highmark Stadium outside of Buffalo. Once those three stadiums are replaced, only Green Bay's Lambeau Field will have stood longer than the Superdome. 
To the right, you have the Smoothie King Center, home to the NBA's New Orleans Pelicans. Originally, it was called New Orleans Arena, as the facility opened in 1999. The Smoothie King Center doesn't have near the history or the legacy that the Superdome has, but during Katrina, what was then the New Orleans Arena held up much better than the Superdome did, as it was built stronger due to stricter codes at the time that it was built, being built 20 years after the Superdome. Well, it too was a place of refuge for survivors of Hurricane Katrina. Medical operations were able to relocate from the Superdome, which had a bunch of water damage to it, to the arena next door, which saw much less damage. Side note, as it's kind of nice to have both of the town's pro sports venues right next to each other. Not every city has things planned out that way. They're even connected with a skywalk, so that's all good and dandy. And this way you can make an event in either the Superdome or the Smoothie King Center that much larger with the connection between the two arenas. Well, so far in this video, there's been a lot of things to point out, which is still going to be the case going forward, but I've got to fit this in somewhere. So now let's transition to talking about the history timeline and how the city became to be. The history of the city dates all the way back to 1718 when Jean-Baptiste Le Moyne Sewer de Bainville. Nope. Yeah, um, my, uh, French accent speaking skills are not up to par despite taking French in both high school and college. But, uh, yeah, um, all right, so, um, what, what is this, uh, Jean-Baptiste Le Moyne Sewer de Bainville, I think. Yeah, well, he founded the city. And five years later, New Orleans became the capital of the Louisiana colony, which was controlled by France, hence the strong French roots of New Orleans. In 1763, the Treaty of Paris was signed, which ended the Seven Years' War, and Spain ended up taking possession of New Orleans, only for France to take back possession in 1800, after the Treaty of San Ildefonso was signed. While Spain owned New Orleans, however, a fire destroyed most of the city in 1788, as most of the buildings were constructed with wood. The Spanish then enforced stricter building codes that would prevent that from happening again. In 1803, however, the U.S. purchased the Louisiana Territory from France for $15 million, which doubled the size of the United States. Louisiana didn't become a state until nine years after that event in 1812, and New Orleans served as the first capital of the state. Lastly, in 1815, the Battle of New Orleans took place, where Andrew Jackson led the Americans to fight the British over the land in which the U.S. won. It was around this time that New Orleans started to explode in population growth. As I mentioned earlier in the video, the original town was the French Quarter. In fact, for about 70 years, the French Quarter was the only part of town. The land is higher in elevation in the French Quarter than it is in any other part of town, and at the time, it sat above the surrounding low-lying swampland while sitting right next to the Mississippi River. Well, once the Americans arrived, that all changed, and the city started to expand and get built. At first, there were strong tensions between the native Louisiana Creole people who spoke French as their primary language and the New Americans who spoke English. New Orleans was divided into three municipalities in 1836 as a result of those tensions. The French Quarter was known as Municipality No. 1. The area that we've been seeing in this video, the Central Business District, was Municipality No. 2, while the Marigny area became Municipality No. 3. This lasted for 15 years before reuniting as one in 1852. Some of those tensions were formed between disagreements of what the future of the city should be. More on that in a minute as this is the National World War II Museum, which was built in 2000. The museum's goal is to highlight the American experience of World War II, and honestly, New Orleans is the perfect city for this museum. New Orleans served as a port of embarkation for tens of thousands of soldiers during World War II. Additionally, millions of tons of cargo and supplies were shipped overseas to help support our soldiers through the port of New Orleans. 
The National Park Service states that over one-third of all Americans who served in the war had traveled through New Orleans. World War II was crucial to the region's economy as well, as it saw a boost after suffering greatly through the Great Depression. So, back to the early tensions between the Creole people and the Americans, as both sides had their justifications for their tensions. On the American side, there were no paved roads in the city, with a population of 8,000 when the U.S. bought the Louisiana Territory. There were no street signs, and there were no colleges. Most of the Creole people were illiterate, and the French legal code ran the justice system. This Louisiana historian in his book says that the place was a colonial backwash of French and Spanish imperialism. For the Creole people's defense, the New Americans brought with them, quite frankly, a racist attitude, and the New Americans didn't like the permissive culture that was present in New Orleans. For example, instead of spending Sundays going to church, the Creole people spent their Sundays in other ways, such as watching a horse race or maybe going out and dancing. And although slavery was most definitely present in New Orleans, black and white people were said to have mingled in New Orleans more freely than anywhere else in the United States at that time. And the new incoming Americans were threatened by that. That's just how society was back then. New Orleans was actually the center for the U.S. slave trade for an era. More than 135,000 slaves were purchased, sold, or traded in this town before the Civil War. Slaves were also the ones who built the early infrastructure in New Orleans, including a lot of the buildings in the French Quarter that still stand today. During the French and Spanish periods of the city, thousands of slaves were shipped to New Orleans from Africa. By the 1800s, over one-third of the population of New Orleans was made up by slaves. It's also important to note that by 1860, New Orleans had the largest free black population out of all of the southern states. The free blacks were often French-speaking, they owned property and they were skilled in a specific trade, or they had a career path of some sort. To the right, we're passing by the New Orleans Ernest Moriel Convention Center. One thing that the New Orleans economy has going for it is that it's a popular town for companies to travel to for business-related activities. The New Orleans Convention Center is the sixth largest in the country with 1.1 million square feet of exhibit space and 3.1 million square feet of total space. So, New Orleans might not have the strongest economy, but they do know how to host events and how to throw parties here in downtown and in the French Quarter. Alright, so during the mid-1800s, New Orleans was one of the largest point of entries for the United States. Over half a million people from multiple European countries landed in New Orleans. Most of the immigrants were from Ireland, Germany, and the Philippines. An additional 10,000 refugees from Haiti settled in New Orleans. After the Civil War, even more immigrant groups came through New Orleans, including Italians, Jews, Croatians, Chinese, and other groups helping New Orleans become a melting pot of different cultures. Right after the Civil War, New Orleans was able to regain the title of being the capital of Louisiana after giving up that title to Baton Rouge in 1849, only for it to return to Baton Rouge in 1879, where it has stayed ever since. Around the turn of the century, New Orleans stopped growing as dramatically as it was growing before, although the population still grew. For example, the city went from being the third largest in the country in 1840 to being the 12th largest in 1900, despite it having 100,000 people in 1840 and having over 200,000 people in 1900. During this era, railroads took over the main mode of transportation over shipping, and that really hurt the region's economical advantage, although the port continued to be a strong source of trade and transportation for the time being. The Port of New Orleans continued to be the second largest port in the country all the way until past World War II. The petrochemical industry started to grow rapidly in the area with oil refineries dominating coastal Louisiana by the 1970s. Not long after, in the 80s, the oil bust occurred, taking away thousands of jobs in the region. Middle class citizens were already heading to the suburbs at this point, but overall, the economy was suddenly looking pretty bleak in New Orleans, which it is stayed that way ever since, to be quite honest. 
The city saw its highest rates of violent crime and government corruption in the 90s, which continued to hold the region back from growing, with tourism being the main thing that has kept the economy afloat over the recent decades in New Orleans. On to the next talking point now, as one of the things that often gets thought of by a lot of people when they hear of the name of New Orleans is how the city sits below sea level. Yeah, New Orleans was never a great location to build a city, and unfortunately it's not something that people learned of until well after the damage was done. Anyway, the city wasn't always below sea level. The way that the city got to be at negative 8 feet of elevation in some spots, though, is a rather interesting phenomenon. New Orleans sort of sits in a bowl between the Mississippi River and Lake Pontchartrain. The soil that New Orleans was built on is very soft and sensitive. Over thousands of years, the Mississippi River has carried sediment from the north down its course to the Gulf of Mexico. And through thousands upon thousands of floods over the years, the sediment from those floods accumulated enough for the land to rise above sea level. That's why the land closest to the Mississippi River is actually the highest in elevation in the city, which might contradict what many of you thought. With the original city being built at the location of the French Quarter, the elevation of this part of town, like I mentioned earlier, sits higher in elevation than the rest of the city. Originally, there were ditches that were dug to help water collect in the swampland behind the French Quarter, or towards the northwest. That, of course, helped prevent flooding. However, as the city grew its footprint, further engineering was needed. In 1915, pumps were introduced, which helped drain the swampland into Lake Pontchartrain. That helped New Orleans expand its infrastructure and grow to be the size that it is today. Before the pumps were introduced, however, the land already was starting to sink. By 1895, 5% of New Orleans was below sea level. The pumps certainly helped speed things up, as by 1935, 30% of New Orleans was below sea level. When water was removed from the swampland, not only was the water that was on top of the surface removed, but so was the water that was below the surface. Draining the swamps created air pockets to where soil would start to sink to fill in those air pockets. Flooding is seen as a disaster to humans, obviously, as flooding can ruin entire communities. Residents of New Orleans know all about that, but the problem is that it was the annual flooding events that occurred here for thousands upon thousands of years that is credited for building the land in New Orleans to be above sea level, so without that, the sediment that has been lost over all of these years can't get replaced anymore, meaning that the land is just going to continue to sink for as long as New Orleans exists. The sinking of the land not only heightens the threat of flooding, but it also creates challenges for the infrastructure. While driving through New Orleans, I thought that they kept the pavement on the main thoroughfares through town pretty smooth, but anytime you head off onto any of the residential streets anywhere through town, those are among the roughest paved streets that you'll find anywhere in this country, and it forces the city to close many of the streets throughout the city, often in order to repair them. In this case, I was in the area of Tulane University. I was on this street literally five minutes prior, and this gate wasn't here the first time. But within those five minutes, someone had placed that gate there, 
and there was no room for me to turn around, plus it was a one-way street, and of course there was no gate blocking traffic for me to enter the street the way that I did, so I moved it in order to continue driving through. Well, you can see it in the buildings too, as you can see the balconies in the French Quarter sagging in spots here and there. Well, on to the next talking point now is you can't talk about New Orleans without talking about why people come and visit New Orleans, right? Mardi Gras, of course, is the biggest event that draws people in, but explaining how it works can be complicated. Mardi Gras is French for Fat Tuesday, so Mardi Gras is the same day as Fat Tuesday. Fat Tuesday is determined by being the day before Ash Wednesday, in which Ash Wednesday is determined by being 46 days before Easter Sunday, in which Easter Sunday is determined by being the first Sunday after the full moon that occurs on or after the spring equinox. Simple enough, right? Well, there's a few more complications to explain too, because the season that Mardi Gras is celebrated in New Orleans is referred to as Carnival, which begins on what is known as the Twelfth Night which is the last night of the 12 days of Christmas, which falls on January 6th. The season ends on Mardi Gras, which can fall as early as February 3rd or as late as March 9th, depending on the year. So Mardi Gras can be a month-long party or it can be a two-month-long party. Mardi Gras is associated with Christianity, but anyone can participate and anyone does participate. Since Ash Wednesday historically is when many will begin fasting from eating meat or other foods, Fat Tuesday is the time to live it up and eat as much of the foods that you so desperately enjoy before you can't anymore. The fast lasts from Ash Wednesday to Good Friday, which is the Friday before Easter. The first Mardi Gras parade took place in New Orleans in 1857, and here in New Orleans, it's evolved into being something that is really special. Today, there are hundreds of clubs, or crews, that can be found throughout the city during Mardi Gras. It really is one of the more spectacular celebrations that you can find, not only in America, but in the world. Along with Mardi Gras, New Orleans is known for its food scene, specifically the Creole and Cajun foods that you can often find at the dozens upon dozens of restaurants. Dishes like jambalaya, gumbo, red beans, and rice are popular here. Often the food is really spicy, giving it a unique style of flavor. King cake is the main dessert associated with New Orleans, which is often served with the Mardi Gras colors of purple, green, and gold. Really, there are very few cities in America that have a culinary scene that stands out as much as what you'll find in New Orleans. Lastly, while many cities try and claim some fame when it comes to music, very few cities are on the same level as New Orleans in this category, as New Orleans is the birthplace of jazz. Wherever you go in the French Quarter today, you'll hear live music playing during all evening hours, whether it's on the street or inside one of the bars. You'll hear something everywhere you go. Can't play the audio from the cell phone, as that will result in copyright claims from YouTube, but you get the idea. Jazz in particular was a genre that was born over time in this city. Now there's several different claims as to how it was born. Some say that it began from drumming and voodoo rituals that took place in New Orleans Congo Square before the Civil War took place. Others say that it began when Buddy Bolden started his first band in 1895. However it started, New Orleans was the first place for jazz music to hit the scene. Musicians such as Louis Armstrong, Jelly Roll Morton, Pete Fountain, and Harry Connick Jr. are all from New Orleans, and they started their music careers here. Well, it's tough to get every detail of the history of this town in one video while trying to keep it under an hour, but I feel like I did a pretty good job. What do you say? Feel free to let me know in the comments down below. That being said, it is now that time. What did we learn in this video? We learned that in New Orleans you can't always trust the integrity of the ground that you're standing on and you can't always trust a hobo that hands you a coupon, but you can always trust Chris's livability score.
The first category is education. New Orleans isn't a city that's known for having the best public schools, although maybe it should be because depending on where you are in the city, a high school student could be attending one of the best high schools in the country, or the student could be attending one of the worst high schools in the country. Unfortunately, there are more bad performing schools in New Orleans than there are good ones, so it gets a 7 out of 20. Next up is crime, and that's a big problem in this city currently, and I went over it a lot earlier in the video, but I've seen worse crime rates in other major cities. It gets a 5 out of 20. Downtown is next, and I'm going to include the French Quarter as being a part of downtown New Orleans, as you could argue that the French Quarter is the real downtown of this city. Historically and in modern times, more people are probably in the French Quarter than they are in downtown on a lot of different nights. But anyway, there is so much going on in downtown and in the French Quarter combined on a seemingly daily basis. There's so much excitement here. There's so much food to try, stores to check out, museums to see, other things to do. It gets a 20 out of 20. The next category won't score so highly as the economy here is poor and heavily reliant on tourism. High paying jobs are far and few in between in this region, so for being a big city, the economy gets a 7 out of 20. Recreational opportunities is next, and that's not New Orleans expertise either. You can go fishing and kayaking, I guess, and you have city parks that offer some decent walks or jogs. Drive a bit away, and there's more boating opportunities to be found. You can find plenty of swamp tours nearby too if you like getting eaten up by mosquitoes, but it's really limited to that. It gets a 6 out of 20. History is next, and that doesn't need an explanation. It gets a 20 out of 20. Your Uncle Steve from the Garden District could talk to you for hours on end about different things on the history of New Orleans. Amenities is next, and this town certainly does not lack amenities. It's also a densely designed city, and from what I found when I was driving around town, most residents aren't that far away from a decently large grocery store or other types of retail stores. Obviously, if you're a tourist, you're satisfied with the options that you have to explore. Amenities gets a 20 out of 20. Last up is cost of living, and home prices in New Orleans are cheap for being a major tourist destination city in the country. A quick look on Zillow shows just how many affordable homes there are in the city on the market. That being said, the cost of living in New Orleans is about 10% higher overall than it is when compared to the national average. So. Home prices might be cheaper when compared to other densely designed major cities in the country, but not when you compare it to the country as a whole. And once again, high paying jobs are far and few in between in the New Orleans area. I'll give cost of living a 13 out of 20 because of those reasons. All in all, the Chris livability score for New Orleans, Louisiana is 98 out of 160, which is a much higher score than I thought New Orleans would have. It puts it in 11th place out of all of the cities that I've done this for so far. Really what that says is that the good things about New Orleans are really good. Like the history, the culture, the excitement, the things to do in town. But the bad things about New Orleans are really bad like the economy, the high crime rates, the overall poor education. New Orleans is definitely one of the more unique cities in the country though, and you can't take that away from it. Every travel enthusiast should experience New Orleans at least once. Well, if you want to see more of New Orleans, make sure to subscribe to this channel and hit that notification bell so that you can be notified every time that I upload a video within my New Orleans series. And you can check out the playlist right here to see more of this town. Peace.